right, welcome back. Um, this is the third segment of our workshop on pre-registration and pre-analysis plans. So many of you in the audience uh, may be somewhat familiar with this topic or may have heard uh, some of the kind of underlying reasons why I'm talking about this. But just to make sure everybody's on the same page, what I'm going to do is kind of go over what pre-registrations are, kind of why you might want to engage in pre-registration. And then I'm actually going to show you how to do a pre-registration on the OSF. So what is the problem that is kind of leading to the suggestion for pre-registration and pre-analysis plans? Well, there are a couple of problems. One is something called the file drawer effect and publication bias. So as we all know, not every study that we do is published. There's some research that we do and we love it, but it can never find a home in a journal and then kind of dies a sad, sad, lonely death on the server bank in the basement. And what this does is it makes it really difficult to discover research that has been done but hasn't been published yet um, or maybe never gets published. And what is particularly problematic about this is we know that research isn't published at random. We know there are certain types of research that is more likely to be published than other types of research. Specifically, research that supports its hypothesis is more likely to be uh, published than research that does not support its hypothesis. This is called publication bias. Um, this is a graph actually showing the percentage of studies in any given field uh, that support their research hypotheses. What you'll see is that the low end is space science, but that's still around 70%. Psychology is way up there at 90%. Now, right, if I knew with 90% certainty before I did anything in my life, whether it was gonna work out how I thought it was gonna work out or not, I would probably play the lottery a lot more than I do um, because that would be a really, really darn good hit rate. Um, and so what this graph is suggesting is that studies that are supporting their hypotheses are far more likely to get published. So there's some sort of bias getting into the literature that is making those studies get in the literature more than ones that don't support their hypotheses. And so what that means is when I'm doing a search of the published literature, I'm getting a biased view of all the research that is out there because it is hard to discover those studies that don't get published. So that's one problem. A second problem is that we as researchers may have unconscious flexibility in our analyses when we think we're engaging in confirmatory research. So what does this mean? It means that as we're doing our analyses, we may think that we are kind of following a very confirmatory path, but actually have some data-dependent analyses that are happening without us ever realizing that this is going on. These are sometimes called researcher degrees of freedom or p-hacking or data phishing or data mining. This can lead to really high rates of false positives and what they do in particular is blur that line between exploratory and confirmatory research. We may actually be engaged in exploratory analyses, not realize it, and then write it up as if it's confirmatory. So this difference between exploratory and confirmatory analyses is really important for this section. So I just do want to belabor the point a little bit. So when we think about research or analyses, we can, if we want to be very dichotomous about this, split it into two types of research. The first is exploratory research. We're interested in learning about patterns that might exist in our data, discovering new associations, generating new hypotheses that we would like to go on and test, right? That's your kind of very prototypical exploratory research. There's also confirmatory research. In that case, we have a particular hypothesis and we want to see whether we're right or not. The test of that is particularly important. Now, a lot of research falls in a gray area between these two. Maybe there's a confirmatory component to it and it kind of an exploratory um, outer ring to it. But we can think about what types of analyses are confirmatory and what are exploratory. For the exploratory ones, it doesn't necessarily matter if our false positive rate is particularly high because that is not the point. The test is not the point. It's really to just see what relationships might be going on. For that confirmatory research where we are particularly interested in testing that hypothesis, then that false positive rate being higher than we think it is, those p-values or that Bayesian analysis maybe not being as face valid as we would like to believe, can lead us astray in terms of the conclusions that we're going to make based on those outcomes. So to define researcher degrees of freedom just a little bit more thoroughly, what they are is all data processing and analytical choices that are made after seeing and interacting with your data. Now this can be things like, should I collect more data? What should my primary dependent variable be? Um, what conditions should I compare? 
what observation should I exclude? So you'll notice that these are really important questions, right? I cannot do my research if I don't at some point figure out how much data I'm going to collect or what my dependent variable is going to be. So it's not that the questions in and of themselves are problem problematic, it's that the timing of them is very, very important. If I ask and answer these questions of my research before I've ever seen my data, I'm going to be answering them in a data independent way. The way my data is turning out can't influence how I answer those questions. If, however, I ask and answer these questions after seeing and interacting with my data, they become data-dependent decisions. And what will tend to happen, because we know there are these great motivations to publish and we know that certain types of research is published, is I may unconsciously begin to answer those questions in such a way that my results will turn out in a way that makes it more likely for them to get published. And all of this can often be happening without us even realizing that we are engaged in this type of behavior. So what this is going to lead to is an inflation of false positives. So this is a table from uh, the Simmons, Nelson, and Simonson paper from a few years ago that actually wrote some R scripts to engage in researcher degrees of freedom. So there was nothing in the data, but the simulations were doing things like having two dependent variables and only reporting one of them, or dropping conditions, or doing some combination of all three of these things, or all four of these things. And so the column you'll want to pay attention to is the one in the middle. Um, in psychology, if we are doing frequentist statistics, um, we typically like to have a false positive rate of around 5%. Um, what those numbers in the middle are showing is what the actual false positive rate was if we were using a p-value criterion of 0.05. So what you'll notice is any one behavior starts to nudge that false positive rate up a little bit higher than we would like. Um, but once we get all the way down to the bottom where we're doing like three, four of these behaviors in connection, we can get false positive rates as high as 40 and 60%. Right? With option four, we'd literally be better off flipping a coin to decide um, if we got a statistically significant effect or not and whether that was a false positive or not. So this can be really problematic if we are wanting to do frequentist statistics where we're using that p-value as a criterion because basically what it means is the results of our studies are not face valid anymore. So what is the solution to this? So the first is to pre-register studies in a public repository to surface all the research that is being done. So what do I mean by that? The first thing we were talking about, the file drawer, the way to solve that is just to figure out what research has been done, what research questions have people investigated. Right? Whether you're doing exploratory or confirmatory research, it can be important to know if you know, 20 other researchers have looked at the effect of chocolate on grad student happiness in an exploratory or confirmatory way, we might wanna know that that research has happened. The other thing to do is clearly distinguish when we're doing exploratory research from confirmatory research using pre-analysis plans. So what this is gonna do is that's gonna decrease those researcher degrees of freedom component of this. When we're engaged in confirmatory testing, when we want to be able to kind of take our test statistics at face value, when we want that test for our hypothesis, we really wanna tamp those researcher degrees of freedom down. And so that is the place where we want to say a priori, hey, here's what I plan to do for my confirmatory tests. And so make it really transparent what was confirmatory and what was exploratory. We can still do all those exploratory tests we want. It's just about making that distinction between exploratory and confirmatory testing a little bit more clear than it is typically in the way we do and write up research right now. So whenever I talk about pre-registrations and pre-analysis plans, a lot of times one of the questions I get is what in the world do I include in a pre-analysis plan? So pre-registrations are on a continuum of specificity. Um, there are some people I know who will write up their entire analysis R script like before they've ever seen their data and that is their pre-registration. And I look at that and I go, that's great, but that's like a pre-registration on crack. I do never suggest that that is like what you start trying to do from the beginning, because um, it will be painful. I mean, maybe it won't be painful if you're just doing the t-test, but like that is, that is a hard thing to try the first time you try this. A pre-analysis plan or pre-registration can just be a few simple answers to a few simple questions, such as, what is my research question? What's my sample size gonna be? What is my primary dependent variable? And what is my analysis strategy? And maybe a simple form of this is just, hey, I'm going to do a multiple regression. Here are my predictors. Here's my dependent variable. 
A slightly more complicated version might be I'm going to do a multiple regression. Here are my predictors. I'm going to uh, mean center these, these categorical ones. Here are the codes I'm going to use for them. Or I could get even more complex and say all that, and then start including information about exclusion criteria for data, right? We can always think of more information we can add on, but the point is that any decision is going to be better than no decision in terms of tamping down those researcher degrees of freedom if we want to engage in confirmatory testing. So it's completely fine to start simple the first couple of times you try these, and then add on more specificity as you go. Right, get more complex, start small, and work your way up. So I'm actually going to show a little bit, have you do an activity, and show the second part. This is gonna work a little bit differently. So what I'm gonna do is actually put those answers to those simple questions in my wiki. We'll talk about other places you could do this. So I'm gonna add my research question. I also am gonna add my sample size, which I happen to know because I gave you all the data set is 199 subjects. Then I'm gonna add the variables I'm gonna use. And I'm also going to add my analysis strategy. <laughs> Which, <laughs> so the nice thing about the wiki is that you know who's added everything. So, you know, I can see that Brian is trying to, uh, trying to take away my, my hard fought research question. So, um, I'm just going to add a couple more things, the variables, which is self-reported gender and self-reported uh, ideology. And I'm also going to add my analysis strategy, which I'm going to be really uh, kind of blunt about my analysis strategy, and I'm just going to do a two-sided t-test. Um, I could make this more complicated, but I'm not going to. And then I'm going to click Save on that wiki and that is all going to be in there. So when we come back for the second little part of the demonstration, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you actually turn this into a pre-registration. But for right now, um, I'm going to give you all a little bit of group work, which is if each group could create a short pre-analysis plan in your wiki that just includes the answers to these five questions. Um, as you just saw, your study sample size is 199, and for your study population, you can just say ANIS 2012 data set. So take um, a couple of minutes, as you saw with Brian, um, more than one person can be working on the wiki at one time. Um, so you can collaboratively work on that. And when we come back, I'll show you how to take this information and turn it into a pre-registration. All right, so now that you all have that information in your wiki, you might be looking at this saying, you know, okay, I have this information in my wiki, but Brian told me that this project can stay private um, for eternity. So how does that exactly fit with the registration component of what you were talking about? How does this increase discovery? So the first step for thinking about a pre-registration or pre-analysis plan is just setting that information down. The second step is actually how to create that eventually public frozen copy. So that's what I'm gonna show right now. Um, I separated this out because this is the part of the workshop that I do not want you to follow along with. I'm gonna show something that's a little bit hard to undo, um, so I don't want somebody to accidentally do this. There is a way to undo it, and I'll talk about that, um, but I did wanna separate it out for that purpose. So I have my information in my wiki, I have my um, kind of really short, simple pre-analysis plan, now I wanna register it. So the way I do that is I go to the registration function on the OSF. What this is going to do is it's going to create a frozen read-only copy of my project as it exists right now that will be time-stamped. So I'm gonna click New Registration, and I have some options of different templates I could use. So we just put our pre-registration in the wiki, which is fine. Some people will write a pre-registration in a Word document or a PDF and then upload that to the OSF. 
other people who maybe want a bit more of a kind of walkthrough of what might be included in a more thorough pre-registration might actually want to use the pre-reg challenge template. We'll talk a little bit later in the workshop about what exactly the challenge part of that is. Um, but if I go to this template, what I'll see is it's actually taking me through the sections of what might be included in kind of a thorough pre-analysis plan. Um, so it has sections for things like research question hypotheses, design questions, analysis plan questions to help me kind of work through, okay, maybe this is the second or third time I've done this, or maybe it's the first time. What are good things should I include? Oh yeah, I didn't think about transformations. What might I include? So if you want a little bit more um, of a structured way to add content, you can always use this template. It's a little bit long, which is why we didn't use it, um, but it's always an option. So I'm actually going to go back and just do an open-ended registration because I have all the content I want in my wiki. So this is just gonna give me a little short summary of somewhere to put information. You can register a project at multiple times, so I wanna put some information to remind myself why I did this, so I'm gonna say pre-analysis plan. And then I'm going to preview uh, for submission, and then I'm going to go ahead and click register. So I have two options when I register. I can either make this public immediately, which means that in 48 hours, uh, the contents of my registration will become public. Or if I'm not quite ready to make this public, maybe um, I'm doing research and it's really important that my research assistants and that my, um, and that my participants don't know my hypothesis, they don't know my research question, so I wanna make sure that they can't publicly find that information, maybe I wanna embargo this. So I can enter an embargo period and pick any date up to four years in the future. So what that means is on the date I choose, um, it will automatically become public. So I'm gonna say July 15th, 2016, because that is when I think I'll be done with my study. Click continue. And what is going to be happening now um, is the contents of my project as it currently exists are going to be copied over into this frozen read-only version. So this means that I will always be able to go back and see, hey, what did I think I was gonna do before I ever saw my data? Because it has that timestamp on there. And because it will eventually become public, that means that somebody can search for that registration. So if they're maybe interested in looking at gender and political ideology and wanna see what research might have been done, they can search for that. My pre-registration will eventually come up and they can maybe look and say, huh, Courtney never published on that, but it's pre-registered and either email me, or if there are a ton of people who have maybe pre-registered on this and none of that has been published, maybe start to dig into why. So eventually, once everything is copied over, and depending on how much is in your project, uh, this will take more or less time. Uh, so I'm just going to refresh. So once uh, this finally does finish registering, what happens is an email is sent to me and everyone else on the project saying, hey, the project has been registered. This is the embargo period that was set if one was set. The reason we do that is to make sure that everyone involved in the project knows that a registration has been made because that will eventually become public. There's a 48 hour grace period though. So maybe Brian and I were talking um, in a meeting at work and he said we should set the embargo period for July 7th. He meant July 7th, 2017. I thought he meant 2016. I set the embargo period for the wrong date. Brian's gonna get an email saying the embargo period was set for July 7th, 2016. He can then email me and say, Courtney, that's completely the wrong embargo date. So he has three options if he's an administrator when he gets this email. He can either do nothing, and if all of the administrators do nothing, in 48 hours that registration will become set. If all the administrators approve it, the registration will also become set. If any of the administrators disapprove the registration, the registration goes away. It's like it never happened. So there's a 48 hour grace period to make sure that everybody is on board with the registration and everyone is on board with the embargo date. So the registration is now finished. I can go into that registration. It has that information about the pending um, section. And you'll see that there's kind of a read-only watermark going along it, and that all the contents of my project are in there. So eventually, if nobody disapproves the registration within 48 hours, 
This will become uh, public on, in July of this year. So now that I've shown you how to do registrations, before we start the Q&A section, I did want to mention one more thing, which is what if something goes wrong? And I put goes wrong in quotation marks because oftentimes in research, the going wrong is the most interesting part, right? A lot of times we get in research results that we were not expecting or we're looking at our data and we see an interesting pattern and we want to go and explore that even though we hadn't thought of that beforehand. So what do we do in that case? Right? Exploratory research is really important and it's really interesting and a lot of the research I did was spurred on by initial exploratory analyses because I thought that's a really interesting finding, I want to follow on that. But when we're talking about pre-analysis plans, people will often say, but I said this was all I was going to do, so what do I do when there are other things I want to do? So as I mentioned, the point of a pre-analysis plan is just to make clear what is confirmatory from what is exploratory. It's not to say you can't do analysis, it's just to say make it clear to everyone, yourself, the reviewers, the readers, which is which. So if something goes wrong, if, you, if something doesn't go as you planned, don't panic. It will be okay, I promise. Um, as the Hitchhiker's Guide says, don't panic. Yeah. So just be transparent about the changes or the deviations that you're making. So use phrases like unexpectedly we found, additional exploratory analyses revealed, or, you know, our data violated all of the assumptions of our planned test, so instead we did a non-parametric test, right? It's just being transparent about those deviations or changes to your plan. So now we're going to go ahead and start the Q&A se section for this segment. So does anyone have any questions? Yeah. You made a really important point, I think, about uh, the distinction between exploratory and what you call confirmatory. But I'd like to ask you about this word confirmatory. This seems to me to send the wrong message mm -hmm. and not to label the critical distinction you're making. If I understand it, you're distinguishing between exploratory and planned. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of pre-registration is that we commit ourselves to a particular course of action. We plan it. And that leaves open the type of research. It might be field, it might be estimation, it might be Bayesian based, it mm -hmm. might be all sorts. Whereas the word confirmatory both, I think, doesn't quite capture this planned aspect, which mm -hmm. is the important one, and it also might convey the baggage that we're doing something with hypotheses, mm -hmm. and very often we're not. So I wonder whether we should use exploratory and planned to label that distinction. I think that's a, a great point because the, there, there's something that's easy to misunderstand with what is called confirmatory analysis, which is it's really all about the hypothesis. And it's not about the hypothesis at all. It's about the analysis plan. Uh, so if, uh, in our research question, if uh, Courtney thinks that, uh, what, what is it, men and women are different in their ideology, right? If Courtney thinks that uh, women are more liberal than men, and I think that conservatives are more liberal than, or that, no, that men are more <laughs> conservative, liberal than women, I don't know what I think. I can't, I can't say what I think. But if we thought different things, who cares? The statistical test is just as valid. Uh, whatever are, is in our minds about what the idea is. So the key with uh, pr uh, confirmatory analysis or planned analysis or confirmatory plans, whatever we call it, is that you constrain how it is you analyze the data in order to maximize the diagnosticity of the p-values that come out of it or whatever inference uh, parameters you use. Uh, it is not to say this was my idea and I was right or I was wrong. Uh, the confirmatory tests, the constrained analyses provide the diagnostic information about the inferences, regardless of what your beliefs are about what's going to happen. Okay, we're out of time for questions now, so we will uh, save questions for the next round. Thank you.